You know, I remember I bumped into Tadzoka for the first time and first, you know, a fantastic job getting Impact Hub going. I think anyone who puts an effort into putting a hub going, really amazing job. Please keep going. Incredible thing you guys are doing. So anyway, I bumped into her at an event and she said to me, you know, Joe, um, I'm thinking of cancelling it, hey? And I was like, please, don't. I've been looking forward to this because Stuart had sent me the invitation and I wanted somewhere on a stage to be able to say fuck and not be, be judged for it. So please don't judge me. I've got rights tonight, right? Now, the second reason why I didn't want her to cancel it is I have so much material for fuck up nights. <laughs> you know, six months I could run the show by myself. <laughs> so many fuck ups. But anyway, for tonight, I have to pick a few. I'm on a clock and I thought I'd share a couple of things with you. First of all, I'm 18 years old. <laughs> right, right. What I mean to say is, I'm still the same 18-year-old guy who fell in love with my high school sweetheart. And this year, we celebrate our 20th anniversary. Aww. And that's one thing I did not fuck up. Aww. It's one of the things I did not fuck up. I'm also the father of four incredible children. My eldest, who's 15, is now taller than me. And he says to everyone that he meets, you know, my dad needs to take a paternity test. <laughs> Smart guy. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Stuart was kind enough to say, I've tried many things. I have failed at many things. And as much as you read about it, it is really true that you learn when you fail. But bloody hell, it is a hard lesson. So... I'm not encouraging you to go and seek for failure, but when it happens, keep your eyes open. My first job was at the Meikle's Hotel. Recently married, first job, resident manager, I get to work in this amazing place. I couldn't have given my wife a better start to life. And then it was downhill after that. <laughs> Four years there, and I move, I leave, I start my first business, which was not this one, it was Creative Elegance. And it was an event management company. Now the crazy thing about me saying that it was my first company was I didn't employ anybody. But you know what it is, when you start, you think that registering a company is what it takes to build a company. <laughs> and it's the biggest load of, well, I can say bullshit here, right? Because if I can say, <laughs> I can say anything. So anyway, um, quickly realized that wasn't gonna work out. Um, moved on, moved on to, no, I thought, no, let me, do a, let me go into production. So I started this company called Boxit, another nutcase idea. I can say that now. Now, the reason I started this business was I hated receiving Christmas presents in weird looking shaped presents. <laughs> I wanted my presents in nice boxes, you know, and these people would send me weird shaped stuff. So I figured, hey, let me start this Boxit business, right? This dumb thing that I thought about, uh, that I didn't think about in this, was not everybody wants presents in neat boxes. That's the first mistake I made. But the second mistake I made in this business was I ordered so much stock to get the unit price down that I had no money left for cash flow. No money left for marketing. No money left for salaries or anything for myself. Dumb mistake. So again, guys, you know, it's so attractive. You go to a printer and they say to you, you know what, if you order a thousand more, we'll give you a better price. And I ordered 10,000, right? <laughs> Big fuck up, don't do that. So that's, that's about box it. Let's move on. Fast forward a couple of years. Now tonight is about fuck up night, so I'm not gonna share with you the things I got right, but I managed to get a couple of things right. Managed to buy a house, managed to buy my favorite car. Life was looking okay. And then again, you know, remember how it was Meikle's and then duh, yeah. it was a little bit of that and then we're back. So I started, like, um, like Stuart told you, I started a magazine called Hello Harari, amongst many other businesses. Now I can tell you that neither Stuart nor Donna are the people I'm talking about. So <laughs> let's be, just because they said they met, I met them there. 
Remember when, with creative elegance, I thought not employing anyone was a mistake. I figured, you know what, the opposite must be the solution. Let's employ a whole lot of people. <laughs> so I went and I got a whole lot of people. I even had an HR manager. So I figured, well, you got an HR manager, sure your HR is going to be fine, right? Don't do that. Spend time on recruitment. Get people one-on-one. -on -one. If you're in a startup, you know, I, re I read about these successful entrepreneurs now who the first 100 hires, they're interviewing personally. Wow, I wish I knew that then. I really wish I knew that then. Big fuck up. No, no need to say, remember that favorite car that I told you I got? One of the things I had to sell, amongst other things. I had to sell those, lick my wounds, and, and move on. Now, the lesson learned there is recruiting right is absolutely critical. I don't know how many of you know Battle of the Chefs. Anyone here watch Battle of the Chefs? Just, okay, thanks, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> you know, you, when, you, when you have stuff on ZBC, you think you might be the only one watching. <laughs> Unless it's the coup or something like that. You know? So thank you, you've just like, whoa. It's been a couple of people watching. It feels, feels good. But I want to share with you um, a really tough, tough aspect of um, season one. Battle of the Chefs, I've been working on it. I wrote the plan in 2010 that I was going to produce a reality television show in 2015. From between 2010 to 2014, I was pitching it to every corporate that would allow me 15 minutes with them. Not a single person <laughs> said yes. At the end of 2014, I convinced that amazing woman who I'm married to, look, let's convert our double lockup garage into a, into a studio. We converted it into our studio. My children at that stage were all in private school. We converted it into a studio. I convinced a whole lot of amazing people to come on board and help me to shoot the show. By the end of 2014, we had finished the season, production of season one. I was $45,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. I had to take my kids out of private school. The most difficult meeting I've ever had in my life was sitting with the headmaster of a school and explaining to them that, look, I have to take my kids out because next year I don't have the money to pay for this. Most difficult thing to sit with my wife crying. So, Big fuck up, yeah? But not funny. Finished season one, and I figured the calls are going to come. People are going to watch this. They're going to love it. They're going to phone. I'm going to get sponsors. Nobody called. <laughs> not a single person. Spent a whole year pitching corporates yet again. Still no interest. And then on the 4th of December, after six weeks of trying to get hold of the managing director of TMP campaign, I got an appointment. So I walked in with a 55 inch screen, put it on his desk. I had a banner, a roll up banner. You know, we all love roll up banners as well. <laughs> roll up banner, which said TMP can pay battle of the chefs. I played the f final episode, five minutes. He watched it. He said to me, Joe, I love it. How much? And he said, come on Monday, let's sign the contracts. I tell you, we, s we left that office, sat in the car, and you can see it in my eyes now. We just cried, just wept. But that was the beginning of the turnaround for us. This couldn't have been done by having the most amazing team. Absolutely. So as much as I told you, don't go employ everyone get the right people. You know, one of the guys here tonight behind the cameras is Clifford, and he's one of my amazing editors. I don't know, oh, there he is there. You know, and he's just one of the people that comes and <laughs> makes things happen. So find those incredible people, and then you can make anything happen. Thank you so much. Yes, season one winner. Season one, exactly. I just want to say your show works because he's come to cook for us a few times and he's absolutely He's amazing. amazing. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it was, it was more of a comment to say, like, it's Thank really you. cool to meet you. Thank you. Because, um, yeah, I mean, he's become, like, every event we have at the, at the house, we call him in. Thank you. Um, Thank you, really Rimbo. Cool. So I think, and he always credits, he's like, yeah, I know, I was 
on Battle of the Chefs and everything. And so for me, I think it's, it's an amazing platform that you've created Thank you so for much. people like him. Thank you. Um, so yeah, like, Remember, look, you know, I mean, that means the world to us to hear, you know, because the reason Battle of the Chefs exists is to change perceptions about there's a big difference between a cook and a chef. Yeah. And what, I mean, the ice creams that he makes. Wow. I know, we still have one. Anyway, so no, you guys, you know, I don't end up having a private conversation here because if, if you haven't eaten with Diankara Chef and you find that he's at some event, my encouragement to you, try it out. You will not regret it. Thank you, Rumi. So that was done. Is there going to be an amateur chef's battle? And <laughs> because, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. And Absolutely. then um, what made you keep on going, keep on trying different <coughs> ventures, and why didn't you give up? Sure. So first one, the, one of the unique things about Battle of the Chefs is that it is an amateur versus professionals. But our recruitment, our if you see our audition process, it is incredibly grilling. I mean, we're in auditioning now, and we'll be shooting <coughs> next year. So not many people make it. And you, you, I mean, even if you see some of our judges, they're incredibly harsh. So you know, we want to put the best plate that is out there. We get 800 applications, and we only have 20 people that go through to the final show. So you know, it's a huge um, cutting process. Very difficult to do. And we have to taste a lot of bad food in, while we're <laughs> <laughs> A lot of bad food. Oh, sorry, the second question. What kept me going? So, you know, I really mean it when I say to you, I think I'm 18. I often forget, uh, and I'm 45, actually. But I forget, and I think it's, I like to try new things. And my favorite thing is to meet new people, you know? So, I love the experience of seeing someone. I mean, like, for, for me to hear her speak like this tonight, it's, it's mind-blowing for me, you know? It's, I think it's nice to know that you can get to do that with, and it's to build a brand. I think it's, so I love it. And I haven't had my best idea yet. So this isn't the, guys, I'm going to be trying other stuff and I'm sure I'll have new fuck up. <laughs> it's two. Yeah, right, so thank one, you. Two, three, four. And then that's it. Uh, I just oh. wanted to say congratulations on uh, doing the Battle of the Chefs. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for bringing Zimbabwe on the map with that. Thank and you so much. It's an amazing program and we enjoyed it. And I've had the privilege of getting to see the, the setup or win that Battle of the Chefs and that's absolutely uh, beautiful. Amazing, isn't it? World class. Thank you. Uh, Thank my you. question is, um, after you got pick and play, was it now easier for you to get more sponsors? Sadly, guys, in Zim, you know, we buck every trend in the world. You know, I don't know why, but you knock on corporate doors and it is the most difficult thing. So it is not, no, let me not be unfair. It's not as hard as it was before, but it's still nowhere near easy. But I can share with you, like for example, our goal for next year, we're, we're doing a fundraise of $1.5 million to build a studio. So that's our goal. And season four is going, once we have that studio, it's to do Battle of the Chefs Nairobi, Battle of the Chefs Accra, and do Battle of the Chefs Africa. So that's where we're, we couldn't have dreamt that big in 2014, but we can do it now. So it does, be, validation is, you need validation. You need someone to say, I can put money into this idea. And that's what TM Pick and Pay did, was to say, no, we believe in this. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Joseph, yes. uh, thank you so much for you know, telling us your story. I'm an independent producer on ZBC, so I understand exactly yeah. what you're talking about when you're worried people are not watching ZBC. I'd also like to thank you because you brought quality content. Absolutely. And we keep having this conversation around creating yeah. quality content for ZBC so young people can keep watching it. So 100%. thank you so much for making your content quality. Thank you. And also inspiring me because getting sponsorship whilst you're trying to, you know, uh, air your content on ZBC is Ish. not easy. All corporates are asking you who watches ZBC at the end of the day. When at the end of the day, who's going to change the face of ZBC? We don't you know, as Zimbabweans. So thank you so much for inspiring me to keep pushing because it does sometimes get difficult. And I hope we can have a conversation after this around Absolutely. training young people around quality content. 100%. So um, I want to address two things in what you've said. Uh, one, um, ZBC. Believe it or not, people watch ZBC. I was at 
I've been in the remotest parts of the country, there's someone who says to me, oh, aren't you on that shift? <laughs> and I'm like, I only appear once on, in a season, once. And for them to pick, it blows my mind. I went to collect a parcel from Zimpost the other day. And the guy says, oh, you know, my wife loves your show. <laughs> so people watch, you know, and I think it's, it's a pity that, you know, we need to invest in our national broadcaster. And I've been totally committed to saying, no, this will go on ZBC. We need... So another mistake I'm so sad to see, I think, is too many producers trash ZBC. And I think that's not smart. We know Facebook works. We know all those things. But guys, 1.6 million people view to watch your show. There's no one, not even DSTV, is reaching those numbers in, in Zim. That's... But is there, there's no data to prove it. <laughs> okay, but thanks. Um, so first, I want to say thank you so much for telling us not to cancel this. <laughs> yeah. For that conversation, because your story and um, Donna. Your story. I mean, just it's so powerful to hear about these um, failures. Um, my question is: so when you get to the point that you are forty-five thousand dollars in. Yes. You're pulling kids out of private school, and you just, is there, I mean, are you in too deep to quit? What is the psyche to just keep going? Because even when Don has talked about, like, where is the money? <laughs> you know, this question where you're like, I'm doing all of this, and then what happens? What, what is that that keeps you pressing on in the face of, it's Adversity. almost like logic doesn't exist oh, or yeah. something. So I'm just curious, like what... And you know, I think that's such an important question to ask. So thank you for, for that. My advice, and I, I think this was, will probably fly in the face of a lot of other things that you'll hear. Find someone that believes in what you do. So whether it's a team player, um, someone on your team. For me, I was lucky it happens to be my wife. But when you go home and you're eating peanut butter sandwiches, if your spouse says to you, what the fuck's going on? You're not going to carry on. <laughs> you understand? You need someone who says, hey, you know what? At least we've got each other. Yeah. So find that person. You know, and I'm not suggesting, it doesn't have to be someone you marry, right? But find someone who can share that difficulty with you. And when you find that person that can share that difficulty with you, don't let them go. Because I'm telling you, it's going to happen again. It will keep you, it, life is that. But you need someone that says, no, it's okay. But on the 4th of December, I promise you, if Pick and Pay hadn't said yes, we were ready. The kids were already out of school. I was going to the most godforsaken place if you're from Botswana, I'm sorry. We were going to Botswana just to say, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Two million people in Botswana only. I didn't know what I was going to do. It was the end of my journey. And so that timing was just, yeah, desperate. I needed it. You know, it was the one thing. I, I shudder when I think, I wonder what I was going to end up doing. So I'm so grateful for that. And, and I'm sure you guys can hear it in my voice. I am totally grateful for that opportunity, you know. So find somebody. And yes, there is a bit of madness. Um, you have to be mad, too. Going out on your own is the most difficult thing. And I don't think we have... So again, one of the things I, I love about what you guys are doing here, that training. The training on what to do, you know, lean startup, all these kind of things. Man, I wish I knew this stuff. I wish I knew, you know, the business model canvas. Man, we would have not done so many of these nonsense. <laughs> well, I've had less material for tonight, but hey. You know, yeah, so that's, that's it. Thanks, Joseph. I was just going to ask um, how you married to life all of that. Oh, jeez, <laughs> man. I married a saint. Yeah. She, so, oh, so any advice? Uh, let me, uh, I can tell you one thing. We were 18 when we met. I made sure she didn't know anybody else. <laughs> I locked that deal down as soon as I, ee, this is the best thing that's going to happen to me. I said, let's get married. Come on. So we got married at 25, but uh, so we've been dating 28 years. And, wow. yeah, and, and I, that's very special for me. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, All right, for our next speaker, um, I haven't met this guy, 
I've met him once today. The first time I heard about him was he had sat down with Putin. The only other person that I've had that has sat down with Putin was, was Trump. So I wanted to find out <laughs> what exactly did he say, um, but beyond that, how he got there. So I welcome Simba Murillo. Thank you. I think um, I have to be the owner that apologize. I didn't prepare my presentation. So I guess that's the first fuck up of the night. <laughs> but um, I think, um, thank you for having me over. And probably what I'll tell you is who I am and two key failures that have shaped my thinking in business. Um, I'm s someone that, was, that sucked at being an employee. Just like Joseph, I've had a career at Miko's Hotel. I moved to Dubai. And somewhere in 2013, I decided to become an entrepreneur. The question is, what was I going to do? So my first business idea was the usual. You know, in Zimbabwe, you're CEO of a holding company. You do the usual mining, agriculture, the big money stuff, all right? But then I came across the family of, uh, came across the family that owned the factory that used to manufacture laundry for La Senza, right? So it was La Senza, Victoria's Secret, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I established a friendship with the son, and he started selling me consignments, small consignments, stuff that I could fit into a suitcase, into a box, and that was my first business. And of course, then I was a big fan of Dragon's Den, and Theopathetis was my idol, so I wanted to become like him. So as you can imagine, lingerie is a very sexy business, right? Women buy a lot of lingerie. It's very lucrative. So just to give an idea of, of pricing, a piece that would cost about $45 retail, I would probably pick up for about $5 and sell for 12 right, all in. So that was very lucrative. Now, the problem came in is that we were doing quite well, moving a bit of stock. I bought my first car, and then the guy said, look, now you have to start moving containers, right? Because the factory can't keep selling you small consignments. So I said, fine. Then I got an order with Edgar's to supply the whole country, right? Now, I, I was so excited in the euphoria of doing small things, right? I didn't understand that when you start moving consignment to supply a whole countrywide full of stores, you have to think about stupid things. Quality control, right? You have to move several containers on the water at the same time. You have to raise money from a bank, right? All of those things. So I walked away from that business. Second business, a couple of years later, okay, two years later, started solar, right? 2014, quit my job in 2013, late 2013, spent my whole savings that I was working for, for for a number of years, building a solar business. What happens? 2015, we have the chance to raise $7 million, and we do, right? So we had certain partners that said, look, we're going to ship through five megawatts worth of, and basically we're building a five megawatt project which costs $7 million. It's going to power 7,000 homes. I got land from my brother to build it on the, 40, on the 41 kilometer peg when you're going to Marondera. There's a big substation on the road. That's my brother's farm. So he gave me 30 hectares of land to build a solar farm. Fantastic. I got the land. The guy said, look, we're going to take a punt on you and we're going to give you a start. We're going to give you five megawatts worth of equipment. You just raise the balance to connect the solar power plant. So in total, it's 7 million, right? We imported 2.1 million euros worth of solar panels. So that's basically 140 40-foot containers took us 16 days to offload these things, right? 16 days to offload them, four warehouses, two in Arare, two in Marondera, right? Now, during that time, the deal was they had to ship by the 31st of December. The, the ships had to leave port. Now, this is August, so I had to step on people's necks, and believe it or not, a process that should ideally take six to eight months took six weeks over Christmas. Government gave me all the things that I needed, except my IPP license, without paying a bribe. I still remember Nigel Chanakira coming on the 28th of December for my investment license interview. And on the 31st, I got the call, you have your investment license. By February, when the ship started rolling in, we had our um, IPP license. We were good to go. National project status, we're all over the news, the euphoria was there, the panels were there. Then something terrible happened. Bank comes back to us and says, Simba, we can't open an account for you. 
someone within your consortium of people has not checked out in his KYC, nor your client. So forget about the loan. We can't open an account for you. So your application is gone. Right? Our partners that we had at the time then attempted a hostile takeover. Say, so since you can't fund the project, we're going to take over the company. Through all that euphoria, I lost everything. Major cock up. Your house, your car, your life savings, everything gone. Right? I mean, I'm, I've suffered from depression. I've become addicted to painkillers. My migraines came back, suffered from insomnia, attempted suicide, the whole nine yards. Right? But one thing I learned from failure was certain things. Everyone's got a big idea till you have to write the check. Right? So you all want to start a big idea. First of all, do you understand what it's, what's in it when you have to scale up? So you've got a big idea, you're an impact hub, it sounds small, it's probably an app, it's probably, law, it's probably fashion, it's probably infrastructure, or whatever it is. But what happens when you have to sign the big check? You do realize money has to come out of your pocket. Can you afford it? Most entrepreneurs don't think about that. So for example, in my business, you will not spend a minimum of 300000 just to get the legal paperwork in place before you can apply for a law. Not many people think about that. Secondly, who are your partners? Not everyone who's got a foreign passport talks in a foreign language and can buy you lunch is an investor. <laughs> That's a fact. Secondly, funny story. Pan, uh, we, we get national project status. Shipment hits the border, right? But there's a delay, right? Because national project status, you're not supposed to pay duty, you're not supposed to pay VAT. Your, product, your, product, your, your goods come in duty free. Zimra has held them because of a paperwork glitch. Our partners are losing their minds, right? So they, it's a budding lawsuit because they're European and they think someone's messed up and Zimra is now on the defensive, right? And this is a very important lesson that I'll, t that I'll teach you now. Everyone's losing their mind. Emails are flying all over. I then, have to, I then happened to call a government official that I knew very well and I said, look, I need to come and see you because I've got this problem. Panels are at the border. So I went to see this lady in the morning at 7 o'clock, presented my case, and she said, look, ideally, you guys are technically right, and probably the government is at fault. But where do you live? These guys will, li will leave. You will stay here. So you've got two ways to handle it. You can either go the hard way, or you can try and find an amicable way of solving things. So without knowing whose fault it was, I walked into Zimra's office and I apologized. Literally said, look, I don't know what went wrong but I am sorry. They, they knew what I, was, what I was doing and we got our help and the panels went over the border. Now I've got my license, I've got the land, I've got the lease, this is running around to give me a power purchase agreement and remember I've now lost everything, eggs in the face of everybody. I literally went to every person that had helped me out, government, non-government, and I groveled and I begged for forgiveness. And you know what they told me? We told you so. Because in the euphoria of having all this money coming, panels are coming, you've ordered your range, it actually was a discovery for a premier <laughs> auto. You don't want to listen to anybody, even my own brother that had given me the land. I did not want to listen to him when he was warning me about the warning signs. I actually thought he was making excuses that all of a sudden Mike does not have the money anymore. So he's going to make me look bad. So I literally went against my brother because the euphoria of having so much money blinded my judgment. Right? But when I lost everything, they said, yeah, we told you so. Sometimes the bureaucratic red tape that we bash on Twitter is actually designed to protect you. And I know this from experience. Sometimes the people that you dislike are the ones that help you out. Fast forward to my latest business, which is Rooftop Solar. I have to raise money for myself because my shareholders, um, my other shareholders have got the money. So as an entrepreneur, you have to have skin in the game, right? So I get a chance to apply for a grant from Africa Development Bank. I applied for 600000 The Africa Development Bank guys, after many months of considering the report, say, we're coming next month for due diligence. Four days we're with you, and we need to all see all these people. One of the people they had to see was Zessa before we meet anybody else. Because firstly, my business competes with Zessa directly. I pretty much take their best paying customers and take them off the grid. So they have to first meet with us and say, is he not only allowed to do it, but will you allow him to do it? 
guys come in in the morning. I call the engineer, Ikupeng Dube. I said, look, this is the story. Can I have a meeting this week? He's visibly irritated. I'm leaving right now. So if you don't come right now, I'm gone. So we go to his office. My stomach is in knots. I think, oh my God, what's going to happen, right? The meeting was about 40 minutes. I think I only spoke for five minutes. The rest of the time, it was Africa Development Bank and the Zesa guys that were talking. My grant was doubled. So Zesa pretty much did, when it came down to it, when I had to talk face to face, Zesa pretty much did the pitch for me because there were a lot of things that I needed that they, I didn't realize. And Zesa actually had to tell them, no, he needs this, he needs this, he needs this, he needs this. So you may have to give him more money. Fast forward a couple of more months, we've got a problem. Getting money from a bank is easy. You default, they take you to court. Getting money as a grant, the reporting standards are a nightmare. Nobody, I mean, probably Impact Club could tell you, the reporting standards are a nightmare. And we almost lost the grant. We talked to every accounting firm, everyone we thought had dealt with, DF, with MFIs, DFIs, and donor agencies. Guess who came to the rescue at the very last minute? Zesa. <laughs> They wrote to AFDB and said, we've got the experience, we will help him, and we will give him the resources. Remember, this is your main competitor here. And we got the grant. All right? So certain things I've learned along the way is, first of all, you need to know, or you need to, actually, you, you, actually, you never know. You need to know what you're getting into. It's going to take a very long time. And everyone you think you know is going to walk away from you. When I lost my first company, everyone, walked away. There was nobody there. The people that least expected it are the ones that helped me. Secondly, when you plan, understand what is required from you. Because at a certain point in time, people are going to say, Simba, I can give you $5 million, but where's your $1 million? So always think that when you scale up your business, what is required from you? Thirdly, don't hate your enemy, it clouds your judgment. If you ever watch The Godfather, it's a famous saying by Michael Corleone, right? At the end of the day, what you have to realize is that your business has to outlast whatever situation is going on in the country. So in my case, a typical power purchase agreement is 30 years. If you look at the election cycle, that's six election cycles that my business has to outlast. And the financiers will ask you, will it last that long, right? So sometimes the people that you dislike, even though you may disagree on principle or policy, but if they are in the office and they sign whatever you need, you will have to work with them, you'll have to support them. You have to be like a, sports, you have to be like a professional sportsman, right? When Alex Ferguson quit Manchester United, did the players quit? No, they didn't. You know, when Mourinho quit Chelsea, did the players quit? No, they didn't, right? So the best thing for you to do is to actually walk into these offices and ask and say, listen, why are certain things the way they are? In my first business, I didn't do that. I just simply said, panels are on the way. Come on, you guys, you're going to make me look bad. I stepped on people's toes. Now imagine the indignity of going back and saying, I'm sorry. And they're like, Simba, plant it good. <laughs> Literally. So I had to go and apologize. So now when things take a year, I'm happy for them to take a year. I actually now use the government's red tape and bureaucracy to stress test my partners. Because if you're not willing to work with me, no matter how long it takes, then I don't want you as a partner. That's a fact, right? And certain other silly things that may not be on a big micro, uh, macro level. If someone ever comes to me with a business idea and they've got a full-time job, I don't listen to you. Do you know why? When things go wrong, your salary is going to come first and you're going to leave us hanging. And it's happened to me before. So when I was in Dubai selling lingerie, I had partners at home that I'd asked to do things and they wouldn't do them because the salary is coming to their pockets. They were very happy if I send them money for fuel. But the day I say I can't, nothing happens. So pick your partners and know your partners correctly. Understand your business plan. How much money do you need? Sometimes winning in business is not earning a million dollars is just surviving. It's just being able to consistently have your product on the shelf and earning a living. In my business in solar, we, earn, we work on very low margins. So I will never become a multi-millionaire. But as soon as the first contract is signed, 
That's my income guaranteed for 25 years without fail. So understand where exactly you're going to be. Secondly, run your own race. I used to race against people. That's why I made so many mistakes. So so and so is about to open his own business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because of that, till today, my brother's got the farm there. But legally, I can never put a solar farm there. Because when you separated from our partners, they didn't leave the company. They just sat on the shares. So be careful when you register your company. Be careful who you have on your CR14. Be careful who you give shares to. Even if you're unsure, even if it's your own family, it's better to go with someone that you know that when shit hits the fan, you can sue and go after them. <laughs> Seriously. Because legally, you can't force someone to give up their shares. Even if they don't have money, they'll just sit on it. And that's what our previous partners did. They just sat on it. So I lost my IPP license. It's there at Zera. But Zera is saying, look, give us a shareholder, give us a bold resolution to say that your partners have left the company and you can build. And because they knew that, they sat on it. That's what happens. A lot of people get into business without understanding the legal implications. So a business idea is always good, but your best friend is always your lawyer and your accountant. And always plan for the worst. I plan for a worst case scenario. Because everything that I thought would go wrong in my business actually went wrong. A lot of it my fault, a lot of the things I cannot control. We raised seven million dollars, eight million dollars doing the old mutual project. Africa Renewable Energy Fund, through another company, said we'll put in the money, right? They come to sign the final term sheet. We have an issue. They want English law. We want Zimbabwean law. But our lawyers have advised us you need to get a neutral jurisdiction. Typical in project finance, right? And cross-border cross -border investments. We then talked to our lawyers and said, look, let us do some research. We can't sign it today. We'll sign it tomorrow. We'll come with an answer. The next morning, the, the investors came with a headline, bond notes are coming. <laughs> eventually, they walked away. We tried everything, but eventually they walked away. So things happen. Right? Things happen. But the question is, do you give up? You just survive. Right? We've had situations with fungi there, whereby lunch, you get short of lunch by five cents. You're scrambling for coins to buy sadza. You're too shorter. <laughs> you know? But question is, how many of my friends actually know that? Very few. See, your friends will be the ones who say, oh, things are tight. Oh, no, I can't really help you. Hey, you know, hey, I understand, brah. You know, I've done this, I've done this. But come Monday, hey, brew club was booting. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, but I just needed X amount of money for you to help me. So these things happen, right? So I always say, if it's fuck up nice, plan for the fuck ups and have risk mitigation. Always understand what are you going to do when things go wrong. Right? Secondly, understand that if it's your company, whether it's a hair salon, whether it's Battle of the Chefs, at the end of the day, it is your project. Not even your partner's, Joseph. Your project. And what that means is that anyone who comes after it, you have to go after them. Ruthlessly. It happens because the thing is, everyone supports you when things are going right. But what happens when things go wrong when you mess up? You become the story in the pub. Ah, he thought he was all of that. Ah, you know, you know, ah, he, he didn't understand. Everyone has got a comment to make. So this is what I learned as well. So from my mess ups, key things I'll, learn, I'll tell you. Understand who your partner is. Make sure you're on the same page. But at the same time, don't, don't hesitate to go after them if they do not stick to the plan. Everyone is expendable except you. <laughs> it is what it is. Right? Secondly, understand the legal paperwork. Plan for the worst. You know, there's, a, there's a famous saying that a good leader doesn't go for battle, but is always prepared for it. Always look for the worst case scenario. Right? And prepare for it. Also understand the numbers, right? How much do you gonna, because the thing is, everyone makes sacrifices at the beginning of the project, but as, as the dream gets bigger, the checks get larger. So you need to understand that from the very beginning. And if you fail, just carry on failing. Because 
a lot of entrepreneurs that I meet today, people that have made it, the first question they ask me is not really about my business, but what is it taken out of you and how are you taking care of yourself? I never used to understand it at first, but they want to know is, are you willing to die for your dream before we give you our money, right? If you're willing to just give up that easily, what about our money when we give it to you? Secondly, your enemy may become your friend. So yes, Zessa helped me out. And only recently are we talking about a partnership with someone I used to hate with a serious passion. But now we've got a term sheet and hopefully we'll form a joint venture. You never know who's going to be your partner at the end of the day. And none of them are my friends or my family. It's people I least expected. Separate the money from your personal relationships. Because when shit hits the fan, you're going to have to protect what's yours. What's yours. And everyone, everyone becomes a target. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my seven minutes, I think. Am I on time? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the advantage, when, here's the good thing when you're rock bottom. Even if you have the chance to pay the bribe, you can't afford it. <laughs> Look, it's about one, of the, one of the things that you have to understand how any system works, right? Government is not bad, but what they want to know is that if they vouch for you, you're not going to make them look bad. You know, everyone walks into these offices with half-baked ideas. Let's be quite frank. And when they're told no, they start to blame bureaucratic red tape, but they're half-baked. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you this, I went and apologized, and it took me a year to get my paperwork. But because it took me a year to get my paperwork, and they threw, they threw things back at me, and I simply did it, you have a certain level of respect. Because here's what you have to understand. The, the, of, the officer or director, right, that you've applied to, even the bank, man, even the bank guy that's going to go to credit, has to be able to defend your project with their life because you're not going to be there. So imagine a situation whereby they defend the project with their life and then you cock up. See, you go and say, ah, oh, well, it didn't work out. You know, I tried solar. Let me try, you know, transport. But they get fired. So you put his family's livelihood on the line. So you have to convince him that, look, whatever happens, I am solid. And you have to respect the process. Because I've got a simple saying. It's like, it's like dating a girl, right? If she's got a certain way of doing things and you don't like it, leave and find something better. So if Zimbabwe is not for you, go to, and you say, oh no, England is better, but England, they do this, then go start your business in England. So as soon as they realize that you're a patriot and you're willing mm. to go the motions, we've never been asked for that. I'll tell you the truth, we've never been asked. I mean, Zessa, we did, we, remember, we met Zessa spontaneously but they vouched for us. Why? And we did get the money. It's public information. Google, AFDB, they did give us a million dollars for free. Because of this. The same Zessa that you guys bash, or people like to bash. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> but here's the funny thing about it. Do you know that within the region is the Zessa guys that are respected? You guys actually pay a power purchase price that is not market rate. So basically, you're asking a baker to bake, bake, to bake bread for a dollar and sell it to you at 80 cents. So I'll tell you this right now for someone who's in the industry. Whenever you see those lights on, you better be happy because you're paying, you're not paying for the true cost of power. That's a fact. So how do they keep the lights on? Let's say that, you know, when, when shit hits the fan, um, you have to save yourself. So I'm just wondering, in entrepreneurship, where's the heart? And how do you separate say your moral values from what you need to do in business. Yes, well, I'll give you a perfect example. Just sit in a board meeting and you'll understand what I'm saying. Yep. 
because I've got a chairman who's my friend, takes me fishing everywhere. As soon as they say the board meeting is now in session, he's no longer your friend. Why the fuck have we not achieved what we're supposed to achieve? You're the MD. Are you the right person for the job? That's what happens. Forget about the macro thing. Because at the end of the day, you've got stakeholders you have, a, you have a fiduciary responsibility to. They've given money into your company. And you're supposed to defend it. I can't go and say, ah, no, I had a problem. No, 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 no. We've given you money. We want a return. That's all you need to understand. So, if actually, so you may say it's a moral dilemma, but I say it's a fiduciary responsibility as a managing director or an investee. Donna will tell you this because she's a wealth manager. You think people are going to understand that Donna had uh, babies, what, what, what? My friend, I gave you $5,000. Where is my man? <laughs> I don't care about who's got a funeral. Where is my money? So you also have to realize that money has no feelings, has no emotions. It doesn't, doesn't change color. It is what it is. There's a famous saying. A friend of mine called Vusi always says, men lie, women lie, money doesn't lie. Follow the numbers. And people want to know what happened to the numbers. So you have to actually separate yourself from all that, what you say, moral, do you have feelings, etc., etc. Unfortunately, there will come a time where you actually have to separate your, yourself from that. When I lost my first business, like when you lose anything in life, a lot of people that you care about walk away from you, right? You know, loved ones, family turns on you, friends turn on you. I just basically had, okay, to sum it up, I said, look, I accept that people walked away from me, right? But I'm going to do it one more time, right? And I'm going to go out on my own terms. So what motivated me was a seething hatred for everyone that walked away from me. <laughs> Forget about the, you know, nice sayings, what, 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 what. It was literally to say, look, I'm going to make it so big. I may not be able to walk to everyone and say I made it, but wherever they are, they will know. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> that was it. Um, it's sort of related to your question, but also your reference to um, the Godfather and being friends with your accountant and your lawyer, right? Yeah. So maybe you watch Breaking Bad as well? Not really, but I've watched Godfather repeatedly. <laughs> so there's a scene where um, they have to dispose of a body. Yes. Huh? Um, in order to like keep the operation going, and maybe as an example, but you know, like where you do the business equivalent of disposing of a body. Like, okay, I would say disposing of partnerships. We do that all the time. Daily, daily. People come to us for, for 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 ideas. We tell you no. We tell you yes. If you come to us with an idea, you don't execute it fast enough. We will go after it ourselves, and we're not shy about it. We, we, we follow, let me tell you, we follow the Econet model. Right? <laughs> no, wait. I had to deal with Econet and understand, how, and, and, and understand how they operate, right? You go to them with an idea. The problem is you're going to, you know, you're going to delay, you're going to think you're all that. You know, the thing is, you're not the person that's going to go in front of Strive and Strive says, where are we with this idea? And you don't have anything to say. So if they can't do it with you, they would have to go through you. I used to hate that model, but I've discovered that that's the only way you get things done. Because remember, like I said, you on the other side, you think that you can take all the time you need, you're the brilliant entrepreneur, you've got the idea. But I've got many people behind me that have also got people they report to and people they report to. And everyone right up, right up to the food chain, probably even your parents here, or you people that are either depositors in the bank or policy holders with a life assurance company. You're not going to take excuses, right? Yeah. So why should I make excuses for you? <coughs> it's that simple. So <laughs> burying bodies, cutting people off, it's a natural order of things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> no, I couldn't afford it. I've never met a person that Absolutely failed brilliant. the training underwear. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you nailed it, man. Thank you, wow. sir. Um, yeah, so, I think, do you still want more alcohol? <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, now um, we're about to come to the end of the event, uh, sadly. But um, well, ask the doctor to give a word of thanks. I feel like I'm in church because this is a religious experience. <laughs> and so much that you've said has been so impactful. So I really appreciate this. And um, I think we've learned so much as a community. And I, I am going to subject people through the reading of one of my favorite quotations because just hearing you speak made that ring in my mind again. It's uh, the man in the arena. And the reason that we can say that you have all fucked up is because you are in the arena. Yeah. So I'm just gonna read that because it just resonated with each of your stories. So, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, the haters, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, or the woman. Donna, Simba, and Joe. Whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood. Who strives valiantly, who errs. Who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds. Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So congratulations, you have fucked up. <laughs> because you are in the arena. And thank you so much. Hope, do you have a gift for our wonderful If Uppers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. And thank you to everyone who's come to Kenny's name. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for coming. Um, I think you have made our day. You see so much criticism for this name. Not that well. You can see, uh, <laughs> it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys. Enjoy your day. <laughs>